Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Mia Michalczyk and I would like to tell you about serious games and research for development. Before I do so, I would like to briefly introduce myself. So I hold a background in environmental and water management and I did a PhD in agricultural systems research at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And since 2012, I also work as an independent consultant for institutions like the UNFAO, the European Commission, the Asian Development Bank, mostly on water and agriculture. So this is my technical expertise working on sustainable natural resource management. But um, since 2018, I also work as a systemic coach and change manager. And with that part, I'm focusing on the sustainable use of personal resources. So so all in all, I'm taking a systems perspective. That's number one that really characterizes me. And second of all, I'm looking at sustainable resource management. And this is also what I found so fascinating about um, serious games. It's a way to really assess and explore the social complexities and dynamics around sustainable natural resource management. But I'm going to tell you more about that now. So I'm going to give you an introduction into serious games. Where did it come from? Uh, what is the history of it? How is it applied with a focus on natural resource management and agricultural research? And then also a comparison with other methods. And I'm going to um, present you a case study. Um, this is from my own PhD. It's on land use decisions in northern Ghana. So what are serious games? Basically, it means playing with an educational purpose. Here you see an image of an Ashanti figure from Ghana. Um, two people playing the Owari game. Maybe many of you have seen this if you have traveled in Africa. This is a very common game. It's entertaining and it teaches arithmetic, actually. This is um, a similar figure from East Africa and here an example from Ethiopia. So... Actually, serious gaming is a common way of teaching and learning in many cultures and there are community games and festivals reflecting that and even the military um, has used serious games um, as simulations um, to develop strategies and to prepare for important battles. Nowadays, and this is a 2007 estimate, the serious games market is really huge. It has been estimated to 20 million US dollars. But here we want to focus on science. And serious games can be used basically for teaching, learning or mediating. So what does that mean? Let's imagine we have a natural resource like land and water and we have three different resource users in the area with different interests. Okay, So if we are the researcher and we would like to understand more of the situation, we would like to learn something. We could use a serious game to understand better what is going on, what are the prevailing interests and dynamics. And if we understand that, we could integrate our insights with additional data. And then we could think about teaching, um, like designing a game um, to convey additional facts and knowledge to prepare them for more informed um, decisions. Or if there are really conflicts around the resources, we could use a game to mediate. So to exchange perspectives, teach one another and reach consensus. So what is a serious game? Um, it's actually a simulation of a real life situation. It's usually really focused on a particular topic. Um, and it's also a simplification and very important um, it's not real, so it should be playful, safe, fun and engaging. Um, and the fact that we would want to simulate a real life situation also means that we need prior knowledge. Here, an image of a serious game, you can see how knowledge intensive the design must have been. You need to know basically when you design a game, what is the natural resource management level we're looking at? When I'm thinking about farming, for example, I would have to decide, do I want to look at landscapes and then community dynamics or at farms? And that would be then household dynamics or at individual fields. And that would be then working with individuals. So that will determine the actors I'll be working with, the resources that we will focus on, what symbols are we using in the game so that everybody will understand it and what units are we working with. What are the characteristics of a serious game? Well, it's goal-oriented. So, for example, the players could accumulate points. There's also an element of interaction and competition. So it's not just about accumulating points, but about accumulating most points. Then there should be rules, so turn-taking. What are the available cards? What do the um, dice numbers mean? How are the points allocated? All of this is, so to say, the playing field um, on which the players 
are interacting and then there should be a feedback so what do my own decisions mean um, what am i achieving with it and what about the decisions and achievements of others i like this graphic and where serious gaming is um, portrayed as the overlap between the traditional gaming just for fun a simulation and uh, the classical learning experience so what about serious games and natural resource management and agricultural research? So in a literature review, I found that it's mostly used as an educational teaching tool. Here are some examples. If you're interested in the examples, you can um, send me an email. I can send you this presentation. And then there are quite some games actually trying to stimulate a negotiation and mediation. This last author, Erika Spielmann, is actually um, a former colleague of mine at the Farming Systems Ecology Group in Wageningen, and she's quite um, engaged into a group practicing companion modeling, and this is a participatory gaming and simulation approach. Um, I know of a workshop that Wageningen ETH, Zurich, uh, Sirat are giving uh, regularly on uh, Komoot and this includes methods such as participatory mapping, model conceptualization, agent-based modeling, role-playing games and scenario assessment. So um, of course serious games are also used as a research method, as a, as a learning tool and Komoot describes itself as a discussion and su decision support tool. Here are some examples of publications. So I think with any game, re researchers um, tend to refine their understanding of the roles, dynamics and choices of the participants. And it's usually a methodological innovation, um, a new process, and that also gives new data. So at this point, I would like to show you a case study from my own PhD research. So I'm inviting you to join me to Ghana, to a community of smallholder farmers. And the idea is that these farmers could be more productive if they would adopt new technologies and techniques. So I've been collaborating with the Feed the Future program Africa Rising in northern Ghana, and they had developed these technology packages with local farmers. And what do I mean um, with technology packages? Let me show you. These are five that I focused on for an impact assessment that I did. Um, there's maize, cowpea and soybean, a maize uh, legume rotation and a maize legume strip crop. And then the technology packages have a technology and a technique component. So technology means, for example, fertilizer seeds, inoculum and uh, rhizobium. And the technique would be row planting and incorporation of green manure. So there you go. These are five technology packages that I compared and looked at. And the question was, for whom are these interesting? So the first research question was, for which farms and farmers? were these technology packages relevant. So we knew that farm households differed and we had data, we did a statistical analysis and we came up with um, different farm household types, a low, medium and highly resource endowed household. So some farms having less land, less animals and some more more animals, more means of private transportation, better housing conditions, etc. So this is what we got from the household level data that was available. And then I also asked um, people how how they perceived um, differences and diversity in their community and we did that actually in a very structured way so men and women separately from different households and they actually said that individuals um, differed in each household there was a re repeating pattern of a highly resource endowed male household head the low resource endowed wife who wasn't owning any land and if the son was old enough he was probably medium resource endowed um, so we published that in two papers and so based on this, we defined a local farm and farmer diversity, so a horizontal and a vertical diversity. And now the question was, what technology packages worked for whom? And um, to keep that very short and to focus on the essential, because we're working our way towards the serious games, um, I did a nuanced impact assessment using a whole farm model farm design and also consulting farmers, how they evaluated the technology packages. And the most important insight that I want to share with you here that different farmers, for example, men, women, um, also the son and the, and the daughters had different interests. So I was asking myself, how does a decision actually come about? I thought, okay, you have these people with different roles and interests, and then there must be the power positions, and that will 
then add up to a certain decision at household level. So I chose to look at land allocation. Why? Because that was a perfect topical interface between what um, was the model input and what was the interest of the Africa Rising project. So I was looking at land allocation to maize, um, cowpea and soybean. And I wanted to then measure power shares. And I developed this simple technique where I would use... 10 sticks and I was asking okay who's part of your household who's part of the decisions for example I would always ask them individually the members of the household and if a person has full control and nobody else has any influence the person would have 10 sticks and if there are let's say two people and each one has five that would mean that they have an equal share in decision making and if someone only has one stick out of the 10, um, then that means someone has little control. So I was, for one household, I was interviewing the different members and it turned out that their evaluation was quite overlapping. But it, in the end, it didn't add up. The self-reported power shares pointed uh, to a situation where, um, for example, the wife and the sons also had a substantial influence, um, while, of course, the male household had had most of the influence. But the decision outcome looked really always like um, the preference of the male household head. So there was a mismatch. And I thought, you know, I only knew all of this from what people told me so I really wanted to observe what was happening so I designed this game on land allocation and this game's aim was to simulate an actual negotiation within the household I wanted to observe and quantify the interactions that were going on in terms of interests and power positions there were rules for example there was a focus on land allocations I had um, given a certain range of crops there was a limited amount of land and I also defined the quality of land you know there was some higher land area and some low land area for example it makes a difference in soil moisture and that again uh, shapes what crops can be grown there you will see that in a minute um, with a picture I'm going to show you of these games and um, for me very important was safety so I thought how do I play this game should I select individual household members that play kind of against each other but then I thought maybe I'm actually creating a conflict if they feel too comfortable in the game it's too close to reality and then it's not as much fun and it's not safe enough so what I did instead of um, inviting one particular household I invited five household heads five wives and five oldest sons and each of these groups had to discuss first individually like what would they want to do with this um, amount of land and then I recorded that and captured their preference and then one of them was the spokesperson and this spokesperson actually was not allowed to be part of the group's discussion but was the function was to capture what the group wanted and then to represent the group during the next step which was the negotiation and as I said first I captured the individual interests and then the negotiation stage and I compared what was the individual interest and then what was the um, household level or the, the negotiation outcome and um, the assumption of course is the more similar the individual interest to the to the negotiation outcome the more power you had and it was the simplification. I looked um, very consciously at the medium resource endowed household. I selected three household members um, that were in competition and it was one process. While I knew that these kind of decision making processes usually just happen behind closed doors and in several rounds um, where people would come together and discuss. Um, so, for example, this is a situation where people sit together and they look at the map. So these are the five household heads, five women and five oldest sons. You can see the, these little cards. So the idea was that we drew um, into the ground what was the land. We explained what it was. We asked them uh, whether they understood it, to interact already with it. We gave an example and then they could kind of with their with a little stick or with a finger demark the territory and just put the cards on top where they wanted to grow a certain crop. Um, so they all got the same introduction and then they went to um, different spaces where they couldn't hear one another and they discussed and you can already see for example on the left hand side the men's group and then the spokesperson is picking the cards acting out what the other group members are suggesting and then I captured the individual preferences and I also translated that into my uh, farm design model again. And I was just modeling what does it mean in terms of profit, soil organic matter, labor balance, how sustainable are their suggestions, and also how is their household level negotiation outcome later on comparing to these individual suggestions. You can see a negotiation. 
And afterwards, I also um, did an evaluation. I asked each of them, not just the spokesperson, but also all the observers, like how they f felt represented by the spokesperson, um, how they liked the or how they evaluated the process and the outcome and who had how much power and how that related to negotiations in their own household. And I have a short uh, video impression of the game that I would like to show you. Dinya apu barba. Manya ye ye dena. Ida ampa anyu nembon. Na chum ye nembon. Kam bole na tete gba sha wora. Yu nwa wula kati en koto kwab ma. Temi kwab ma za nyela ikapia. Ikapi ma. Wula kati en kwale. Ikapi ma mi pune. Ba nyela ika na pregle. Ka ba chele. Ka nye Ika, Karagui, Ika de Bapoy, the Pergoli, the Nyakuko Alamba, to Borcona Netoko, to Bornuan Netoko, to Boris Manetoko, to Borsavis Netoko, Ula Catian Co, you know, Coma, the Zocambo and the Caracatabasha Wara, Tinian Coco Masham, Catazabai, Catuatuman, then the Nyakambo and Amba. Jara. <laughs> Money, <laughs> Look for Sma 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 Dom sika wuna ma de lehwa kulum ni yan nan sham na malwa malwa na jaka de kwale e kata to ka ko banchi e ka mhm za ri pai ka wuna ma zo ka no e ka na to tun ko banchi ma e ka ma ma yi yi da na de kwala ta ni yi da ma ni ya pu zo ba bin jalla be ba jalla de sum na to zang la e ka ma Quand <coughs> 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 Wode omana no nazua. When your private zang sad in sad in a cabre. Simama pun or Nazu will mean come and toss in a bishop. Mana will be back pardon. Never let the button mana and not the smile. Simani, don't forget to put the mana. Never yell, Simala, man, not to a burn mana man of Simama. And take Simama. Catch your mana man, Malay, Cartiola, and welcome. 
So you had a little impression and I used all the data that I got for an interaction analysis, a social network analysis. What you see, the colorful carpet there on top is actually a sequence in seconds. And I um, counted exactly how much time each of the negotiators spoke and you can see this pie chart already looks quite similar to the power shares um, that the the household had indicated before and I also looked who was sending and receiving information what was the frequency and the, what was the time so we could read something from this all of this was just embedding what the participants reported themselves on the power positions and I also measured the kinds of disagreements that could be observed and here um, you can see the compromise that the different household members made. So the first column is the household heads, their target area and their deviation in comparison to the household level result. The wives and the sons the same for the different crops. And then I added up in the gray column the, the total deviations and we can see the household heads deviated 2.5 um, acres from the household level results. Um, in total and the wives had by far the highest deviation so this is already giving a first indication of who was getting their will and who was not um, and we can also clearly see that no one of the three um, negotiators got their exact will so it is a compromise and um, we also um, measured the power shares um, here you see um, um, the results for the game and for reality so this is reality, <laughs> just like the participants um, reported it. But we can see that they were evaluated as quite similar. And one interesting finding was that each um, negotiation group um, was evaluating their own share as highest. So the men, for example, evaluated their own share slightly higher than uh, the evaluation of the um, son and the wife. And same for the wives, you know, the red dots are on top and for the sons, the green dots are on top. So it, that's actually a good sign because it means everyone overestimated their shares a little bit, meaning that they had a more positive feeling about the negotiation. And um, that is the idea of a win-win or making the pie larger. And I found um, that power can be used withheld or overruled. So I could actually understand why there was a mismatch in the previous assessment so i understood that the power can also be important across decision domains and in time especially because we're looking at complex systems rather than linear ones so the game really helped me to um, see the dynamics i really understood so much and to be honest you know i needed one afternoon to design this game and then I went once to the community to get the people together and inform them that during the coming days I would like to play this game with them, um, when would be a convenient time. We agreed on time and then playing it, so two to three hours I would say, and I really got an incredible amount of um, data out of it and I, I published um, my findings and the methods in land use policy in February 2020. And just to compare the serious gaming method to other methods a very common is of course the household survey and this is a very direct consultation you basically ask people tell me and it's one person usually and then of course always the question whom are you asking and then focus group discussions um it's also a direct consultation. You ask again, tell me. Um, but more similar to the game, you, you have already group dynamics um, and you have a purpose for select selection of different participants according to gender or farm type, for example. And you can also do participatory mapping, which is also a direct consultation, but more visual. So it's not just tell me, but also show me. Um, so yeah, there are already elements that the game covers. What about the rapid rule and participatory rule appraisal? Well, here with these methods, you work very closely with the community and you are also very aware of your target group and you try to empower people like you want to see their own decisions happening. So that's very close to the game that I played. Um, but then I think during the rapid rule and participatory rule appraisal, you are going through scenarios that are more hypothetical rather than being acted out or being on a stage. You know, you don't go through so many scenarios, I think. I think it's less of a simulation, but then the outcome is used more for action. It has more real life consequences than the game, for example, I played. 
Of course, when you play more of a mediating game where you get people together and you want to achieve an actual outcome, it also has a real life consequence. But then also gaming comes at a later stage during the research because you need prior knowledge. So especially if you want to use it as a teaching tool, but also as a learning tool, when you want to learn something about the community, you, you first need to have basic information and design the game. So I would argue that it's not a rapid method. And that's the main difference to the participatory and the rapid rule appraisal. So to wrap up, potentials and limitations of serious games. I think serious games are nicely complementing other data collection methods. It gives new qualitative and quantitative data. It's also a very immersive um, teaching method. Uh, you can target students, farmers, politicians. It's also an experience and an observation rather than a talk. But it is limited in the number of participants and also in its complexity. So this was my introduction for you into serious games in the context of research for development. I hope this was interesting for you. Um, maybe you have comments, um, additional links to resources. I would be very happy if you would just comment under this video. Um, please uh, use this as an exchange. Reach out to me, reach out to the other authors of the paper. I think we are a very nice community of people who like communicating about our research, who have really something to share, who would like to learn more. So I'm really happy um, to be in contact with you. So I would like to thank you for your attention. You can contact me uh, at my email address and uh, via LinkedIn. Um, these are my two preferred contact options. So thank you very much again and all the best to you.